Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to class number five. So far in the nine-week series we've looked at eBay and we've looked at selling on Amazon. We've looked at using web stores through pro, pro stores through eBay and the Amazon web stores. And now we're going to take a little bit of a different tack. We're going to look at actually owning your own business. Instead of sharecropping on somebody else's property, we're going out on our own. Now, this isn't going to be for everybody, but if you want to really be a business owner, this is where you take control. You take that little light you've put out on eBay, and you start using it your own self on your own website. We're going to cut the cord. No more standing around waiting for your landlord to tell you what you can and can't do, who you can and can't sell to, what your profits will and won't be. From here on out, everything you do is determined by your own self. This is your website. You're not bound by anybody else's rules. You're not going to be handing over any party or big profits to somebody else. And you're not going to be locked in and locked out of your website or your business by somebody else's determination that you've broken a Vero rule or that you've put the wrong email signature in your uh, receipts or that you're doing something that they don't like. Now you make the decisions. You're the boss. From here on out, it's a new day in your business. You're the one who decides what you're going to do and whether or not it works. If it doesn't work, you're the one who's responsible for the failures, no excuses. If it does work, you're the one who reaps the benefits, no profit sharing. From now on, we're going to be brave. Every day, we're going to try something new. If eBay's safety net makes you feel like you can't break out, you, you need that safety net, then owning your own website may not be for you. If you do feel that you're starting to be a little bit constricted in your traffic, then this is the time to move on. You don't have to quit eBay. eBay is one part of your arsenal, but it's not your whole business. When you're selling exclusively through eBay or exclusively through Amazon, you don't own your business. You rent your space from eBay or Amazon, and they own you. So from now on, we're going to try something a little bit different. We're going to build new skills. We're going to learn every day a new thing that we can do, and we're going to do it. You're going to own your mailing list. eBay is not going to tell you who owns your mailing list, or who's on it, who's not, who you can send it to, who you can't what you can say, what you can't, whether your links are good or bad. You own your list. If you get blocked for being a spammer, that's your problem. You don't turn to eBay or daddy or mommy and make them help you fix it. You learn how to fix it, and then you do better. You're going to own your own blog. You're not going to go out onto WordPress or onto Blogspot and have them bring you people to read it and say this is okay, no you can't do that, we've got a report that you're selling and we don't like what you're selling. If people don't like what you're selling, they won't come to your blog. It's going to be your problem, nobody else's. But when you make money, that's your money, that's your business, that's your success. You're going to own it. You're going to go higher than you've been before, you're going to have more confidence, you're going to have more success, and you're going to have more profits because you own everything. From here on out, you don't wait for eBay to drive traffic to your store. You don't wait to see if somebody else can bring in your customers. You do it. You're partnered with Google. You're not owned by Google. You pick your keywords, you pick your strategy, you bring in your own traffic. You don't get stuck out in the woods, left alone to rot because eBay didn't like your keyword, wouldn't let you use the word that best described what you were selling because it was a Vero violation. If it is a violation, then you get stuck with the consequences. If it's not, you get stuck with keeping all that money your own self. From here on out, you're the boss. You don't answer to anybody but yourself. Your success is your own success. Every day you get up, you make the decisions, you own your business. 
So let's get started looking at what that means. We're going to go through a number of the tools you'll need to work your business now. And each of these, we could spend a whole class just showing you how to actually use some of them. But a lot of it you're going to learn how to do just by doing it. You'll make some mistakes. That doesn't matter. You learn through your mistakes. That's what it means to own your own business. Nobody's right all the time. You'll maybe take some losses in the course of these, these things as you experiment. That doesn't matter. You don't succeed without failing first. You have to try things over and over again to find out what works. You're never going to be satisfied when you own your own business with your first result. You're never going to sit back and say, well, I learned how to make 20 bucks, now that's good enough. If you learned how to make 20, then you need to know how to make 40. Then you need to know how to get a higher profit margin out of that 40. You're never going to just sit back and be content. So don't worry that it doesn't work the first time or that you don't understand everything you need. You're going to be a business owner. You're an adventurer. You're going to learn how to do all of these things. And with the uh, Web Seller Circle and with OSI Rockstars, you're not alone on these journeys. You have other people who are doing the same thing who are always going to be available to help you. So the first thing you need to do if you own your own business is have a name for it. Uh, if your business is already established in the physical world, when you come and get a website, if you have a store, you want to try and match the name of that store pretty closely for your website because you have an established customer base. Now, you've heard Cindy and I say we used to have a store called the Garden Shed, or we had a, an organic gardening store, and you may or may not have heard that it was called the Garden Shed, but it was. So when we uh, were running that, this was very early days on the web, and nobody had a web presence, so we didn't at that point either. But if we had gone online and tried to register a domain, we would have registered thegardenshed.com because that's what our customers would have looked for. We wouldn't have registered um, organic gardening in Seattle or best supplies for organics or something like that. Well, if you don't have a presence in the physical world and you don't already have a loyal customer base, if you're starting from scratch, you have a little more latitude in naming your business. It's a good idea to try and match the name of your business and the name of your URL, but it's not always possible. Sometimes you'll find that name has already been registered. Sometimes you'll find that somebody has registered .com but not .net is available. And what we want to tell you in this episode of Profits Outside of eBay is how to decide if .net, .info, .org, dash, somebody's already stolen my business name, dash seattle.com is a good idea. No, it's not. You want as much as possible to have as short a name as possible. Look at the sites that are really, really successful. eBay, four letters. Amazon, one common name, dictionary word. Google, nobody's ever heard of that before, but it's short. Yahoo, short, sort of a dictionary word, kind of easy stick in your mind word, kind of easy to remember how to spell. The big sites don't have hyphens, they aren't .net, people by default are going to type .com, so you're just driving your business to your competitor with a similar name if you just try and get cute and go .net or .org. Uh, or even weirder still, .edu or .gov or something totally inappropriate, stick with the .coms. Try to avoid those hyphens. Yes, you'll hope that people will be finding you through links and they won't have to click on them or type them out, but a lot of people actually are going to just have your name somewhere and try to type it in. If it's a long, complicated name with a bunch of hyphens, they're not going to find you. They're going to get frustrated. All of us try to type accurately. Almost none of us do. We all have what's called fat fingers. You hit two fingers on one key. 
you hit a comma instead of a period for dot com. You can't remember if the the name of the URL starts with the or just the word itself. So do you go to the organic store or is it just organicstore.com? The garden shed or gardenshed.com. You want to try and make it easy on your customers. So use garden shed. Less typing, better. But while you're at GoDaddy, also register the garden shed. Any combination of misspellings and common usage and easy ways to un- misunderstand the name of your store, register them all. You'll see right here, new.coms go for $9.99. Um, it's really easy to find cheaper domain names on GoDaddy, either by just t- going to Google and typing godaddy.com, and you'll see that if you use their link, you can usually get them a little bit cheaper. Uh, Janelle, Cindy, and I all have GoDaddy affiliate links you can click on, and we'd all love you to use our affiliate links because, I'll be honest with you, this series is free. It's like seeing a commercial on TV when you use our affiliate links. It helps pay for this free stuff you get. Um, And usually our affiliate links will give you a little bit of a discount as well over just going straight in and buying them. But even at $9.99 a year, that's cheap. That's nothing. That's a business expense. You're a business owner now. You have to think like a business owner. You're going to take this off your taxes. You're going to make so much money that you need deductions, and this is one of them. So if you want to register .com, um, gardenshed.com, go ahead and do it. But register The Garden Shed as well. Register garden spell well, nobody spells garden wrong, but shed, shack, shack maybe shed with two Ds. Maybe if you have, if it was the garden shop, and I spelled it S-H-O-P-P-E, you'd also want to register it S-H-O-P, things like that. And you don't build separate websites. This doesn't mean you're going to have 10 websites. When we get into web hosting, you're going to see another thing called park domains. This is uh, domains where you just say, I own these 10 variations of this, of this domain. I want anybody who types any of these to come onto this one single landing page, which is my website. So the next thing you do after you register with GoDaddy, and I'm not going to log in and register because, as I said, Janelle's already done a class on this. You can go back and find it on Rockstars and, and register your, you know, if you need a refresher run through on one of her mini trainings. But do be aware that when you register with GoDaddy, they are going to try and sell you a bunch of other services. There's nothing nefarious about this. They're in business too. And all this other stuff they sell is one of the ways they're able to keep the price of their domains very low. Domains used to cost $35 a year. GoDaddy's one of the main reasons that they're now under $10 a year. GoDaddy underpriced everybody, cheap domains for the whole world, which opened up the internet to almost anybody. And one of the things that subsidizes the cost of the domains is their web hosting service, their email service, their blogging service. All of those things are okay if you're a hobbyist. As a business, they're not what you want. You want to register with a registrar, that's what what GoDaddy is. The technical name is a registrar. You want to register your domain with a registrar, but you want to host your business with a web hosting company. Two businesses do two different services, and each of them does it a little bit better because they're specialized. You don't want to try for an all-in-one solution. This isn't a Swiss Army knife. You don't have to have room in your pocket for just one tool. You want to be able to go out and get the best service at the best price, or at least a competitive price. And that means that when you go to web hosting, you're going to move away from GoDaddy. You're going to go to either a company like HostGator or Bluehost. These are the two I recommend right now. HostGator, you see, is about $7.95 a month. And, and really, that $7.95 is probably more like $9.95 if you're buying one year. $7.95 is usually a multiple-year contract. 
or you're going to go to Bluehost, which is six ninety five a month. Uh, if you buy a multiple year contract, it's more like seven ninety five or eight ninety five or something for a single year. What both of them have in common is um, unlimited hosting, unlimited file transfer, unlimited domains, virtually unlimited email accounts, and then a whole lot of other stuff. Plus, you'll get a free domain when you sign up with either of them. Um, I would still register my first domain. See, unlimited, unlimited, unlimited. That's important. Why is that important? Because, first of all, as we said, you're going to have a whole bunch of domains that may be pointing at your website besides just the, the real name of your business, and you don't want to be paying 10 bucks for every add-on. Those add-ons should be free. It's also important because as you grow, you may find that you want to put up some extra websites. Maybe your main business uh, is selling a like... Now, I'm... I'm I'm going to use a real business here, and I hope she doesn't mind. Diane Bell with Worldwide Traders Online. She brings in a lot of really interesting exotic things from Mexico, um, Day of the Dead dolls and, and things like that. She has enough of a following just for those items that although the name of her business is Worldwide Traders Online, she's found that stuff that isn't Mexican can stand on its own. So she might have another website for things she's importing from Peru, which she does. And she might have, uh, in a while, she might want to have another website for things she's importing from. Maybe she'll have some pre-Columbian art or something that she's bringing in from somewhere else. So she may want to have more than one website, but she doesn't want to have to go to the expense of setting up different websites on the same host and paying 100 or 150 bucks a year for each of them. With unlimited sites, all under one account, all 795 a month. Um, that's important because it makes it not just cheaper, but it makes it much easier for you to administer. Everything is in one place, and you're not spending a lot of time trying to flip back and forth between different websites with different policies. So you want to go to a place like Bluehost and look for unlimited hosting. And generally speaking, I would sign up with GoDaddy for as long as you can get your, uh, the name of your business, and that's usually 10 years. So with GoDaddy, when you register the no domain name, go for the 10-year registration. Uh, you've got a commitment to your business, and you want to own that name. So go ahead and pay you know, the whopping $60. As I said, it's you, you're going to make a bunch of money. You're going to want deductions. You're going to write this off. 60 bucks, nothing. Go ahead and pay it. When you come to your hosting company, though, the first year you're with them, I would recommend, even though it's going to cost you an extra 12 bucks because it'll be an extra dollar a month, go with the one-year contract so you're sure that their service meets your needs. Don't try and save a dollar a month by signing up for three years with somebody you've never done business with. I've done business with Bluehost for about five, six years now, and I really like them. They fit my needs perfectly. That doesn't mean they're going to fit yours. So before you make a long-term commitment to your web host to save a little money, go ahead and check them out with the one-year fee. Now let's log into Bluehost, and I'll show you what else you're looking for. If you don't already have a web host and maybe you don't like Bluehost or HostGator for some reason, and again, this is the kind of thing where you can come in directly and sign up. Cindy, Janelle, and I all have affiliate links to this. You can get in through all of our affiliate links. We'd all really appreciate it if you use our affiliate links. Um, but you don't have to. There's no obligation on this stuff. It's just like I said, it's a commercial you know, you buy Coca-Cola watching this TV show. The TV show is free. You don't buy Coke. You have to pay for cable. So I'm going to sign in here to my account. If I can do this one-handed. And I'm going to show you one of the features that I really like about Bluehost. Now, this is standard... Um,
Okay, here's where we see who has fat fingers today. This is a standard kind of control panel called C-Panel, but not everybody offers it. The web hosting company... Here comes the secret mouse. There we go. The web hosting company actually has to pay for this, and not everybody pays for it. So you may find that your host has some kind of cheap imitation control panel that's much more difficult to use than cPanel, or they have uh, non-standard applications inside of their control panel, which if you don't uh, know how to do some of this stuff can make it harder for you. I would suggest that if at all possible, you go with a hosting company that uses the real thing, which is called cPanel. You can see it right up here, cPanel. And um, when you look down along their sidebar, I lost the mouse again. When you look down along their sidebar, you'll usually see something telling you what version of cPanel it is. cPanel, blah, 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 cPanel version, blah, blah. That lets you know it's the real deal. Now, as I said, this is important for two reasons. One, you're getting the standard web applications. There, there's this thing on the web called LAMP, L-A-M-P, that stands for Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Those are the four things that go into the back end of most websites these days. And if you follow their standard usage on cPanel, your web applications will be integrated, much easier to use, and much easier to administer. You'll be able to use a whole lot of other things that are built to integrate with those four applications without your having to know how to do any programming yourself. So, for instance, if you want a WordPress blog and you're not on a site that has PHP and MySQL, you're just going to have to pay somebody a whole lot of money to figure out how to get their web applications to run on a non-standard service or on a Windows service or on something that doesn't have your version of PHP. Not worth the trouble. Much better just go for the standards, and that would be cPanel. When you get in here, you're going to see a whole bunch of stuff after you log in. And uh, most of it's kind of uh, not all that important. Up here are other people that are trying to sell you some of their services. That's nice. Uh, last, last time we looked at cPanel real briefly in the HTML class, uh, we looked at some of this. For instance, when you sign up, you're going to get free credits with AdWords and Yahoo, and you have to click on these ads to go through and use them. That's certainly worth doing. You can set up how it looks here. That's not very important. You're not really going to spend a whole lot of time back here on the back end. So uh, the look isn't all that big a deal. You are going to want to look closely in the Word, in the email section, uh, in the file section, in the log section. So, and you're going to come down here at the bottom where we have domains and applications, and that's really important too. But let's spend a minute up here with these things. Email accounts, I'm going to click on that, and you'll see I have a bunch of different domains, which we're going to talk about in a second, associated with this account. And you can put an email account on any of those domains as simple as typing in your name. Uh, trying to remember what I'm in here as. I'm going to put one in for my cat. So I want my cat to have email. I just give her her name at the domain I want it at, and I'm going to stick with this one, even though I'm logged into the dburn Associates account. If I want my cat, oh, he should have one. It's named after him. If I want my cat to have email at ghostleg, um, I just type his name in, give him a password. That's a very bad password. That's a very inadequate password, but better. 
and say create and that's all you have to do to create an email account. It's just that simple. You have virtually unlimited accounts with this kind of $8 a month. Is that important for a business? Well, if you go to a business, and now remember, you're on the Internet. Nobody knows you're one person in your pajamas in the living room. If you go to Amazon and you want to ask a question and you have a choice of email addresses between jeff at aol.com or help at amazon.com. Which one gives you a more professional feeling? Who are you going to trust your, your money with? Who are you going to want to give your credit card information to? You're going to want the business that has the name that matches the store. So you want to be able to create these accounts, you want to be able to access them easily, and you want to have an unlimited number because you may want to use your your own name, you want may want to use sales at the name of your business, info at the name of your business, help at the name of your business. Depends on what your business is. Maybe uh, you are a landscaping business and you want to not only have three or four different people who are important, uh, in answering important questions, but you'll want accounting, you'll want um, uh, troubleshooting, you'll want quick come out here, my gutters are broken and my house is flooding. You know, you may want really a wide range of sales to target to your customers. So you want to go ahead and be able to use as many of uh, these email accounts as you can. And with this, it's just that easy to do it. And if you didn't follow that complicated process of typing in a name, there's a video tutorial here that'll show you how. And we talked a little bit in a previous lesson about how you set up the accounts. Just scroll down here and follow the information and configure email account. It really is very, very simple, and you'll have no trouble doing it. Let's get back here on the cPanel again. If you have a lot of trouble with spam, you can use this anti-spam thing. It costs 10 bucks per email. Uh, I would suggest you configure Spam Assassin. Let's have a little look at that. I'm already enabled for Spam Assassin, but if I weren't, instead of saying Disable, this would say Enable. You would just click it. The higher the score is, the... Uh, let me see. I don't want to say this backwards. The lower the number is, the more strict it is on spam. So 10 will let a lot of stuff through. 1, you'll probably get a lot of stuff that isn't spam in your spam box. So you want to be careful with this. Start at 5 and then figure out what kind of uh, setting really works for you. When you're feeling pretty confident in it, you might want to go to auto-delete spam. If you're a service business and you get a lot of questions from customers and a lot of them are um, maybe not chosen all that cleverly so that they get tagged as spam, you don't want to auto-delete it. You want to be able to go into your spam filter occasionally and look for somebody who says, I sent you that and you never responded. But the problem is you're going to get so much spam, and you know this, that finding the two legitimate emails in the in the mountain of dreck is going to be very difficult. So I usually just auto-delete my spam after I get to a setting that I feel has a, a really very low rate of false positives. Don't worry about box trapping or account filtering, and stay well away from MX ent entry. Um, MX entry, if you, if you mess that up, you're not going to get email at all. So stay away from that. Uh, mostly you just want to use the spam filtering and the email accounts. On the files, you can use the file manager or you can use FTP. We've talked about that before and we'll look at FTP a little more closely. A little later on we'll, we'll look again at FileZilla as a way to download, um, upload files from your computer to your accounts. Um, you, you, depending on what you're doing, you may want to enable anonymous FTP. If you have the kind of business where you are sharing things for free 
with your customers, like you have ebooks that you want them to be able to FTP, or you have um, some other kind of large files, you may want to set up anonymous FTP accounts, and having this full service control panel allows you to do that. However, be very careful because you're opening up your website to potential security threats. So you want to be careful before you make things, just jump into things like anonymous FTP. Um, I would recommend until you really feel like somebody who's in control of things that you not do it. So um, file manager is the safe, easy way to do it. FTP is the much more efficient way to move large, large files quickly over the web. You'll want to explore both of those when you have your own website. You're also going to want to use statistics. Now Janelle's going to give you a whole class about Google Analytics, which is one of the best ways you can uh, explore who's coming to your website and what they're doing. Google Analytics tells you a lot more than just, I had 500 hits today. But sometimes you just want to know, is anybody coming in here? It's, it seems like nobody ever knocked on the door and we don't know what's going on. Well, you want to be able to enable logging on your website so you can get some real-time analysis as well as what you get through Google Analytics. And the way you do that on cPanel, it's not automatic. Make a note of this. It is not automatic. You have to go in and enable logging before you're going to start tracking your visitors. So what you do is you come down here to logs, you choose log program, and you'll see that you have the choice of whether or not you want these statistics to start showing up. Now I haven't done it on this one so I can show it to you. These are the programs I have, AW Stats and Webalyzer, to make sure I can check the statistics on this site, Ghost Lake Media, all I have to do is put little tick boxes in the, in the checkbox and save changes. From then on, that site will be following statistics as well as the others, but it will take about 24 to 48 hours before you start to see anything. Once you do follow your statistics, you can just go into AW Stats, and you'll see here's the, the sites, not including that one that we just did because it they don't have any information yet. You click on, what do I want to show you? I'll show you this one. I'm not embarrassed. You click on your spyglass and it'll bring up statistics for you for the month. And as you can see, you have a number of things you can look at. Unique visitors, number of visits, pages, hits, and bandwidth used. And you can change the months throughout the year different statistics. You can change the years, different statistics. You have a, a lot of choices going back basically from the time you enabled it until now. These are your rough stats. Unique visitors doesn't tell you a whole lot. It's not the most important thing you can know because people can be coming in for all kinds of reasons and that's why Google Analytics is important. That'll let you track not just who's coming in, but what they're doing once they get there. And you want to attract people with commercial intent if you're running a business online rather than a hobby site or uh, uh, if you're running a site with like just you have a site with AdWords on and you want people clicking, then you just want a ton of people coming through. If you're adding a business site where you're trying to target a good audience, you don't care if a hundred people come in by accident and then click right back out. Those are not uh, your people, so the gross visitor traffic doesn't count very much. And as you go through, you can see how many people are coming in on any given day, what days of the week are the busiest, what times of day are the busiest, what country most of your visitors are from. You can actually see the uh, hosts that are busy. This will give you an idea if you're running into trouble. You may need to ban certain uh, IP addresses. Hopefully you won't, but you can find them here. And you can see how often you're being 
spider. This is very important information to know. How often Google and Yahoo visit your website? Are they visiting it once a day? Are they visiting it lots of times a day? Are they visiting it once a month? The higher this number is, usually the better for your uh, spidering. And how long are people staying on your website? What's your bounce rate? What files are they looking at? What are the most uh, popular pages on your site? What are people looking at? What are they doing? What do they want to know? That'll help you. What browsers are they using? And who's referring them to you? What external sites are sending them? And then the real heart of this thing, what keywords are they using to find you? That's something that you can never study enough. You need to know what people are looking for, what words are sending them to you. If they're really using the keywords you want to rank for, then you want to make sure that those keywords are um, featured prominently on your website. So that's how the statistics that are built in work. When Janelle shows you uh, Google Analytics, you'll see a whole other way to look at your website. And you don't want to rely on anyone's just one person saying, this is the truth, because it's not. Google checks them in one way. AW Stats checks them in another. Webalizer checks them in another. And you may find on the same day all three disagree about how many unique visitors you had. So this is like anything else, even all the information we're giving you here in this series. Don't believe anything from one person. Test it and verify it with your own experience. Uh, where's that mouse? So that's your logging programs. Now here's another thing that's very important, and that's your domains. We told you that we wanted you to go into through a program like Bluehost or HostGator because we wanted you to have the ability to have unlimited domains. Maybe you can save a buck by going through somebody else's web service and getting one domain. As you grow, it's not going to work for you. This is like saving money by going and buy clothes that really don't fit. Yeah, you save three bucks buying those shoes, but now you can't wear them. You didn't save anything. You wasted your money. You have to buy something that lets you grow. The clothes that fit you in kindergarten could be cute as a button. Buy those little tuxedos for children. That's not going to, you know, the guy's not going to get married in that. He's going to be a lot different person by the time he gets married than he was when you bought that adorable tuxedo when he was five years old. Maybe it costs less than it does to buy one for an adult and it seemed like a really good price, but it's not. You have to plan ahead and you may have to change. Maybe you're on a website that's holding you back. When that uh, service contract is almost over, don't wait till the last minute now if you're switching. You want to plan in advance and switch about a month before your contract ends. But maybe you're going to have to switch over to a different web host. So plan for that as well. What you want is these websites that give you the unlimited subdomains, unlimited add-ons, unlimited park domains. You go in through all of these things and they'll show you how it works. So if we go in and we look at subdomains on my site, you'll see that I have a whole bunch of subdomains here. Subdomain is listed at the beginning of your domain. So if I go and type elegantebooks.ghostleg.com, I get a site that's just for elegant ebooks. I didn't have to register a new domain name with it because uh, I, it didn't need its own domain at that point. It's just a subdomain. But if I want to give uh, Elegant eBooks its own domain or I want to promote it to its own domain, then I want an add-on domain. Okay? So when we go to look at add-on domains, we're going to see a different process. It's not just going to have a list of things and I'm not going to just say, type in a new word at the beginning of a domain that I already own and be able to call it anything. 
what we have to do is a two-step process. First, you go to your registrar, which we're going to pretend is always GoDaddy. There are hundreds of companies that register domain names, and if you use another one, that's perfectly fine. But just to keep it simple, I'm going to say GoDaddy. First, you go to GoDaddy. You say, I want to point your name servers from wherever they are now to Bluehost. By default, when you register, GoDaddy's going to point them to its own parked site. So you just go into dom my account, domains, name servers, and you change the name servers from whatever GoDaddy calls them. If you're on Bluehost, you change them to NS1, that's the letters NS for name server, the number one, ns1.bluehost.com, and ns2.bluehost.com, and you say, okay, GoDaddy says, oh my goodness, are you sure you want to do that? Look at all the wonderful things we do, and it'll only cost you another 30 bucks a month. Say, no, just change the name servers, and then come back to Bluehost. That takes effect probably within a minute, 60 seconds. When you come in here, I don't have a domain that's not already associated with my account, so I can't really demonstrate this to you. But you would type it in here on use a domain that is not already associated with your account. That's your new domain name. Step two, verifying. You'll see it working, and it'll be really fast, and it'll say it's verified. That's because you've changed the name servers and told them to point over here at Bluehost. That's all the verification is. It's not actually you. It's just verifying that Bluehost is going to be the hosting site. Then you say add on domain. Here where it says use a directory or create a new one. Um, generally you're going to create a new directory and you're just going to type the name of your, you, your... If I say had just registered osirockstar.com because Janelle forgot to and now I'm going to steal all her business. Yeah, whatever. I would come <laughs> over here and type it in in this spot, and it would fill it in automatically as a subdomain as well. And then I'd click that Add Domain button, and that's it. I now have a new domain on this site. It's as easy as that. You just read the directions, follow along. You can't really get lost, and if you do it wrong, all you do is come back and delete it. You, whoops. You went a little far there. All you do is delete it if you make a mistake. It's not the end of the world. Nobody's going to die. Nothing horrible is going to happen. You're not going to lose any money. You're just going to lose a little bit of time and be a little bit annoyed with yourself. But remember, you're going to learn from these mistakes and be stronger. If you've gotten a bunch of domains registered with misspellings, common misspellings of your own name and things, then you park them. You use this park domains thing. Um, and you use a domain that's not already associated with your account, blah, blah, blah. You go through the same business. You just park it, and that means it's going to point to your domain. And then redirects you can use um, for... Where to go? Come down here, Belly. Redirects you can use for stuff like you've registered a domain, but you're not building a site. You've just registered a domain because you want to have... Uh, people be able to type in the name of your store and go to eBay, your eBay store, because it's a lot easier. So maybe you've registered the name Deburn Associates uh, as your domain, and I have an eBay store, which I don't. I might want to have a subdirectory or a folder just backslash eBay. I would use this redirect to just send people to my eBay store when they typed in Deburn Associates backslash eBay. So that's where you do that. It's really a very powerful thing to have these tools at your command. If you don't have these on the website, you already, if you have a website and you can't do this stuff, seriously think about changing your web hosting when your contract is over. Uh, if you need to do this before your contract is over, change beforehand. You're not looking at huge amounts of money. Um, but think about it and plan for it. Don't just... Don't just start flipping accounts wildly because you can end up really hurting your Google rankings if you don't do it properly. 
uh, databases in MySQL. If you're lucky, you'll never have to fiddle with that, but it's there, and it's another thing that's very powerful. And then your software services. You'll see Fantastico, Simple Scripts, WordPress, uh, various shopping carts. These are things that will help you get the most out of your website by using it to um, install scripts like shopping carts, forums, bulletin boards, WordPress blogs, all of these things that used to take a lot of programming skill. You'll be able to do with just a few clicks of the mouse um, yourself once you own these accounts. And again, if you do it wrong, you just delete it and start again. If you find that the process is actually simple, but you're not interested in wasting your time doing it, you can hire somebody to do it for you. What we want as business owners is not to necessarily do every single task ourselves, but we do want to be in control of the process. We want to make the decision, this is what I do, this is what I delegate, and this is why I delegate it. We're never going to delegate out of fear here. We're not going to say, oh my God, technology, I'm a girl, I can't do this stuff. I was raised to wear pink dresses and not break my fingernails. None of that stuff anymore, no excuses. Technology is not hard and it's not scary and every day it becomes more user friendly. You're going to understand all of these processes, how they fit into your business and you're going to be able to say, I could put up that blog and spend two hours tweaking it and getting it all right, but you know what? It's just not worth the effort to me. I'm not that interested in doing it. I don't have the time to do it, and I could much more profitably be spending my time going out and networking on a social networking site for this extra hour I have during the day and bringing in new clients and new customers that way. So that, you know... You look at it and you say, okay, an hour on Twitter, that made me 300 bucks. An hour putting up a blog, that cost me 50 bucks, which is the better way for you to spend your time. Or you may say, an hour on Twitter, I just wasted the whole time talking about the Beverly Hillbillies. So, you know, be honest with yourself. Maybe you're going to do it, maybe you're not. But make it a business decision, not just a, a decision made out of, I don't know how this stuff works. Know how it works. If you owned a bricks and mortar store, you would come into it every morning and you would know what was going to happen in that store during the day. You wouldn't know everybody who was going to cross your doorstep. You wouldn't know what they were going to buy. But you would know that if they asked you a question about your business, you would know the answer to it. In my gardening store, if somebody came in and wanted to know something about trees, which is something we had nothing whatsoever to do with, I knew where to send them. I didn't feel embarrassed by not knowing the answer to that question, and I didn't worry about it. But I knew that if people were going to ask that, I had to have some kind of answer for them. You're the same online. You don't need to know every single little jot and tittle about how programming works, but you need to know what does and doesn't work for your business so you can make decisions based on what's profitable for you. That's all I want to show you here about the back end of Bluehost. So I'm going to log out and I'm going to go to a regular website. Now, this is what a traditional website looks like and this is one of the things you can host on Bluehost. You've probably seen websites like this. This is uh, just, this is Cindy's website. What a coincidence. And it's got a whole lot of different things on the front page, lots of keywords. It's got a whole lot of pages that you can splash around and see what she's doing, what she's selling, what her different departments are, what classes she's teaching. These are all individual pages, all made with uh, an HTML editor, like uh, I happen to know what this one's made with. This one's made with front page. But you might use Page Breeze, you might use Dreamweaver. This is a traditional website we're all used to. This is a blog. We've all seen these by now, too. Every day, there's, or a couple times a week, hopefully, there's a new post telling you something um, that new on top, 
There'll be a date. It'll be short. It won't go on for a really long time. There'll be some links on the sidebar, maybe some more pages, but not a whole lot. And that's how websites have been built up until now. I'm going to show you now a website that I'm working on for a client. And this looks, I would think, if you don't know, this looks like a traditional website. Right now this, pay, this uh, website is up to 20 some pages. I think there's 25 or 26 individual pages of information um, on this website. You've got pictures, you've got um, nice effects, yeah, that's not nearly as interesting. Um, you've got a header here that changes. You've got drop-down menus. You've got all kinds of stuff going on. And it's got an integrated blog. What's interesting about this website is that this website is built entirely on WordPress. There's not an, a drop of HTML coding that I did on this website. And yet, it looks like a traditional website. It can do everything a traditional website can do, except you don't have to hire anybody to make the back end work for you. The big advantage to doing it this way is that what we've got is content management. We've got a class coming up on blogging, and you're going to learn a little bit about this. But what that means is, if these guys come in and decide they don't want to look like they don't like this picture I have on the front page or they don't like the rotating header I'm using, they can change the whole look of the website with a couple of mouse clicks and not have to change a word of the content. The design and the content are separate. As a business owner, this is very powerful for you because it means that you don't have to hire a designer every time you want to make a change. You don't have to hire somebody that knows how to code every time you want to put in a new logo. You just can hire somebody to do one or the other, or you can have an employee go in and update details. Like these guys um, love to put in weird stuff like so-and-so has worked for us for 15 years. Whoops, now it's 16. Whoa, here it comes 17. Um, and every time they do that, they'd have to hire me to come in and change the number 16 because they didn't like to, they didn't want to do HTML, they didn't want to use FTP, they didn't know how to get into the back end of their website. And something as simple as changing 15 to 16 would turn into an easy $50. Well, I'm talking myself out of that job at the moment by making it easy enough for them with WordPress that they can figure out how to come in and just change the number 15 to 16. As a business owner, you're going to want to consider which of these models works for your website. WordPress isn't perfect. It's not the best e-commerce site. It's a good one, but it's not as scalable as some others. So maybe you're selling 15, 20 uh, items. You can get a pretty good shopping cart on WordPress. Maybe you're selling 3,000 items and each of them has its own size and its own color. WordPress may not scale very well for you, so you want to think about it. But that's a decision you'll make for your own business. This is a possibility. The other thing you're going to need to be able to do as a business owner is accept money. We all want to be able to do that, and that can get complicated on the web. Again, we're starting out. Most of us are probably not at the point where we need a full-scale shopping cart with um, a, a separate merchant account through a bank. If you do need that, hooray for you. Hire it done. Don't cheap out on that. That's a uh, difficult little bit of coding, um, and it has several steps. Getting a shopping cart is only one step. It sounds like a shopping cart, if you're not familiar with it, a shopping cart sounds like you get a shopping cart, you're set. No, you're not. A shopping cart is what it says it is. It's what customers look at and put their stuff into. But you can't collect your money from your shopping cart. Your shopping cart doesn't pay. Your merchant account pays. Before the merchant account can collect the money from the shopping cart, there's a middleman. There's the cashier in the store. On the net, there's something called a gateway. So you need these three separate pieces to collect Visa or MasterCard. You need your shopping cart, 
you need your authorization gateway, which will be something like authorized.net or something like that. And you need your merchant account, usually with your bank. And if you don't have all three pieces and they don't integrate well, you've just created a giant headache for yourself. So this isn't something you want to try and do on the sly or on the cheap. This is something you're probably going to want to have help with. If you're not there yet, however, PayPal makes it incredibly easy for you to... Uh, we're going to not mess with Janelle's PayPal makes it very easy for you to accept payments. You just log into your PayPal account. And I have to be quiet while I type that, or I'll say it out loud as I'm doing it, because I type and whisper to myself. Um, and I'm not going to do that because this is being recorded and you'll all get in here and steal all of my big money. I empty my PayPal account totally every day. Um, so you come into PayPal, you log in, you go to Merchant Services. Nothing happens. Here we go. And PayPal has made it as easy as pie. Uh, you've probably all used the send invoice stuff. You can use a virtual terminal if you want to accept credit cards. They make it possible to do it without a merchant account using a virtual terminal. Uh, costs like about $30 a month, I believe. And you can PayPal will help you set that up on your site so you don't need the whole traditional shopping cart. Or you can just use Buy Now buttons or Add to Cart buttons uh, on PayPal. And these have become quite powerful themselves. The buttons, if you just have a few things, you, um, you just make an individual Buy Now button. And you can do it for products, services, donations, subscriptions, recurring, or gift certificates. It's really easy. And you just scroll through. If you want to make the button add things into your cart, you obviously would do Add to Cart instead of Buy Now. And you can have drop-down menus to customize a button. By which I mean, let's look at that, and you'll see the example here. If I'm selling a shirt and it has different sizes, I can have the person be able to pick that out. That's really a, a great feature that PayPal's added in the last couple of years. I'm not sure how long it's been, uh, but you didn't used to be able to do that, to become much more flexible. And because a lot of your buyers may be coming from eBay. They'll already have PayPal accounts. They'll already be familiar with a lot of this. So you can just create these buttons on your own. You walk your way through, and I don't know if it'll let me do this. When you're all done, I don't want to create a button. I'm lazy. But when you're all done, you add, click Create button, and I think I'll get a, a an error message here. Now look, they'll let me do nothing. Um, when you're all done, all you do is select this code and you go into your web page or you go into your WordPress back end, um, depending on what you're using, and you paste it in where you want it and you get a Buy Now button. It's encrypted, it's safe, it's convenient, and it's the easiest way to start getting payments on the web. So if you don't want to go through the hassle of a shopping cart, and you're just selling a few things, um, that's the best way for you to do it. You can also use Google Checkout. Go to checkout.google.com. If you don't already have a shopping cart, set one, I mean a Google account, set one up, and then come back here, and you'll be able to do something that looks very much like PayPal, only it has Google's name on it instead of PayPal. It's worth your while to give your customers more than one option. You don't want to overwhelm them. If you give them too much, they don't know what to do. But if you can give them Google and PayPal, you'll be able to uh, answer the objections of the people that don't like PayPal, and you'll also be able to send invoices for credit cards, um, which people seem to accept more through Google than they do for PayPal for some reason. So look into taking money through both of those. Now, we've talked about HTML a bit, and we mentioned this once before. When you make a website, you may see classes teaching you how to make a website, and that's all fine, 
But what you want to learn to do is not learn everything there is to know about HTML. What you want to learn to do is use your software to do the tasks you need to do. So if you're going to take a class, take a class in Dreamweaver, or take a class in Front Page, or take a class in Page View, or EnView, or whatever HTML editor you use. Now, Page Breeze is free. It's very easy to learn. It mimics Word, uh, it mimics Front Page pretty closely, which is a lot easier to use than Dreamweaver, um, and it is pretty good on web compliance. So it's a good place to learn to do this. I would suggest you download it. It's www.pagebreeze.com. It has a lot of templates built in, and you'll be able to make your own web pages. You can upload them to a private directory if you don't want the world to see them on your website. Um, and learn how to do some of these tasks for yourself. You'll be able to make your own PayPal buttons. You'll be able to experiment a little bit with different looks for your website. So even if you don't plan to do a lot of coding yourself, get a free copy and learn how it works so that when somebody does do some coding for you and it's not working, you'll be able to have a good idea why. You can say, well, I want you to go in and change that left-hand sidebar from blue to green and know what a left-hand sidebar is and that it can be changed from blue to green so that if your web designer is uh, says, no, that's not possible, this is, this is hard-coded into the website and that's the only way it looks, you'll know that your web designer is either uh, crazy or lazy and you'll know whether or not you want to stick with them. You won't know that if you don't know anything to start yourself. So get it and just look at it. We've also talked a lot about FTP, and once again I want to encourage you to download FileZilla. You may or may not be downloading a whole lot of programs, but the ones you do uh, download for your website are the most important tools, are the HTML editor and the FTP client. So get FileZilla, and you get this from FileZilla-project.org. Now, that's, that's a mouthful, isn't it? What is that? This is why you... I'm going to show you real quickly. Hopefully we won't crash the computer and knock ourselves offline. Why you want to make sure that you register domain names similar to what you are. If we go to FileZilla.com, what do we get here? What is this? This is not what we want. This is why it's important for you not to let your domain name go out to somebody else's account. So make sure to register your own domain names. When you're trying to find FileZilla, you may have to Google it to get it. It's FileZilla-Project.org. Download it. Follow the um, tutorial that's available on Bluehost or or CoStGator. They have very good tutorials showing you how to use it. The other thing you're going to want to do if you're making websites is learn to work with graphics. Now, you don't have to become a genius photographer or Photoshop guru, but you do need to know a few basic things like resize, um, rotate, crop. You may want to be able to uh, change the orientation of the picture, flop it from left to right if it's an arrow, things like that. Photoshop Elements, as Janelle mentioned in her newsletter, is on sale, and you can come over here to the Ghost Leg blog, which is ghostleg.com forward slash blog, and scroll back a couple of days, and uh, you'll find the link to the sale price on Photoshop Elements. It's, it's 40% off for, I think, till the end of April through Adobe. They're just they're just blowing out big sale on that. If you don't want to pay for Photoshop, there's something called the GIMP. That's open source software. It's uh, like Photoshop, not exactly the same. And like most open source software, it's a little bit easier, a little bit harder to use, has a little bit more of a learning curve to it. 
but if you want to get something and not not pay even the the 50 bucks that Photoshop is going for right now you can try the GIMP at www.gimp.org. There's an online community that will help you learn to use it. As I said, it is a little more difficult for my money than Photoshop, um, but you can do that and it'll it'll be uh, worth your time. It's another thing that's worth the investment, at least to have the basics. Now, the other thing you're going to want to do is go to Google and sign up for a whole bunch of Google accounts. Not different Google email addresses, but tools that Google offers. If you go to Google and just sign in, you'll see uh, up in the corner there's something called My Account. And once you're there, you'll see what you've already got. And of course, you're going to want Google Analytics. Janelle's going to give you that as homework. So here's a little uh, early warning. Um, but look at the bottom where it says try something new. Click on that more. You're going to want to sign up for a whole bunch of Google tools. You'll be amazed once you start using them how much information Google makes available to you for free and what extraordinary amounts of really important information about your web website you'll find through uh, different search tools, different keyword tools, all the stuff Google gives away. You're going to need to sign up for a bunch of these. So um, if you don't have a Google account, you're going to want to get one of those. Now that's all I want to go over with for you today. That's a whole lot of stuff I know. And it is important that you learn at least the basics of all of this, but not today. You don't have to learn everything at once. As we said at the beginning, today's the day this starts. It's not the day it ends. Today's the day you jump off the cliff. Hopefully, you're going to learn how to fly before you hit the bottom, but you're not going to learn it all at once. That's a really weird metaphor. Um, something less drastic that doesn't end in a splat. Okay, think of your own <laughs> metaphor. Um, no crashing, no burning. We're all going to be successful because we all have the talents and the tools. You just The reason I'm thinking of the cliff is because what holds most people back from doing this is fear. And today's the end of your fear. Today you've seen what the tools are, what you need, and you can do it. Now we are still here to help you. You don't need the safety net from eBay or Amazon, but you do have the safety net of OSI Rockstars and Web Seller Circle to back you up, to help you, to keep you on the path. <laughs> <laughs>